Welcome to DIYDSP.com, the YouTube channel that is absolutely crazy about synthesizer knobs. The second half of today's video is going to be a special treat. I'm not going to give away the secret right now, but it's got to do with synthesizer knobs and some professional musician friends. So what are we looking at right now? This is a Behringer Neutron. It's a really cool synthesizer that my friend loaned me. And what's so important about this? Well, if you count up all the knobs on it, there are 37 of them. And what's so significant about that? Well, if you are looking to build or design a synthesizer that is in the class of the Behringer Neutron, you need a way to read 37 synthesizer knobs plus some extra controls into your, into your microcontroller. Currently, there's no microcontroller that I know of that gives you that many analog inputs. So, you need something called an analog multiplexer, or a MUX. And in this video series, I'm showing you how mine that I designed works. It allows you to have up to 64 synthesizer knobs using just three wires connected to your microcontroller. So welcome to part three. Parts one and two, you should definitely check out because they have a lot of great technical details. And now we're just going to get started where we left off. So in part two of the series, the last video, this is what we had so far. I'd built up one of these circuit boards and I'd proven that we we're able to read all of these values successfully into a microcontroller and read them into a computer. What we're going to do now is we're going to complete the daisy chain. So the way the system works is if you want more than five knobs, what you can do is take some additional boards like this and just keep connecting them in one long daisy chain. So you need a cable like this that's got five wires on it, or six. And you find the connector right here. And you attach that. And then you just chain the other two on there. It's supposed to be that simple. The idea is that not only are you using a small number of wires on your microcontroller, but it's really easy to wire up your synthesizers inside and the space is not cluttered. So we've got 15 knobs in here today. So next we're going to try it out on an Arduino and see how well it works. Okay, now that we've got all the knob multiplexer boards hooked up, let's take a look at this. This is the terminal program called PuTTY. I have found that the serial monitor that came with the Arduino is not quite suitable for this work. So that's why we're using PuTTY. All right, what you see before you is a column of numbers. There should be 15 of them here, one for each of the pots. And then you're gonna find that when I turn one of the knobs, ready? We see a little bar graph. Woohoo, woohoo. So you can see the number next to it, and you can see the number climb up, and you see that the maximum it gets to is 1,023. And we could try to put it exactly halfway, for example. So some of the things that um, you may be noticing, that you may be wondering about, first of all, why is this cursor bouncing all over the place? I hope that's not too distracting for you. That is just because the screen is getting continuously redrawn. So you're seeing the cursor where the terminal happened to be. I think this is drawn about a hundred times a second. Another thing that you might notice is that the value is oscillating between 511 and 512 here. And a lot of these other values are oscillating between 0 and 1. That's a phenomenon called analog to digital converter noise. Um, most systems, well every system has some noise, and most systems like this based on microcontrollers that you can afford, as opposed to $50,000 government projects, are going to have some noise. Uh, so, and it's up to you to figure out how to handle it. There are all kinds of ways to handle it. We can get into that in a future video. But the main thing to see here is that the noise is not very significant. I'm only seeing it oscillate by 
plus or minus one out of 1024 units. So usually what I would consider good enough for a knob is if you can get to 100 or say 200 different positions typically um, without much oscillation. So I think if we divide these maximum values of 1024 down by 5 I think that noise would go right away. It's also possible to put filters in there but we won't get too far into that. So another thing that we want to look for is that when we turn one knob, I'm going to turn a different one now, it doesn't affect the ones around it. See, that's actually possible for systems like this to happen. It's complex, but internal to the microcontroller are, is um, another multiplexer, believe it or not. And in, in a poorly designed system, sometimes you'll find that values from one channel can affect the other. But so far, I'm not seeing much evidence of that. So let's see if every single knob works in isolation. Starting from that end, no, let's start from this end. Whee. I'll tell you what, let's try to make like a little ski slope. That goes down. Then let's make a skateboard ramp that goes back up. And another thing, maybe we can make a sinusoid. There we go, all the way to the top and then back. Another thing that we can look for is the responsiveness. So I had a question, Some a YouTuber was asking me about that in one of my comments in a previous video. So I wanted to demonstrate that here. There we go, that's kind of a neat little segment of a sine wave, no? So I did some things in the code to speed this up. The first version was just meant to be to verify it works and then I've done some things to make it really fast. So what I'm going to do now is try to move a knob really fast back and forth and you can judge for yourself if that's responsive enough. Seems good to me. We're, we're limited by the screen refresh, which I said is probably around uh, 100 hertz. Of course, we're also limited by whatever my laptop is doing, which may be 60 hertz. But anyway, I think you'll find that the regime that your hand moves in is around 5 hertz. You know, maybe some people are really fast and 8 hertz, but this is probably like 4. So I'm hoping that's responsive enough for um, actual professional music, but if you stick around for, like I said, the second half, we're going to see a little bit more of that. First, let's get into the Arduino program just a little bit, because I've made some changes since the last time. So right from the top, one of the first changes I made is that I'm now running on the L476 RG. I think one of the main reasons for that is because I wanted to have two serial ports. That's a huge hint about the second half of this video, by the way. What would that second serial port be for? We know that the first one is for drawing this bar graph in the console. And I found that this dev board, the L476RG, while almost identical in every single way, has um, a second serial port available. The other thing I've done is I've decided to put all of the analog values into one 64 unit array. And let's see, here's where I'm initializing the serial port. Over here, I'm initializing a second serial port at 31,250 baud. That's an unusual number. What do you think that's doing? More later. Uh, we're just going to skip that little part. The other thing that I did, let's go down to the actual loop. Where is that loop section? Bar graph plot. Oh, here it is. So I made it so it either runs in a simple loop, like the old program that just displayed the numbers without a bar graph or runs this bar graph loop. And the bar graph loop has two main functions. It does a full chain read and stuffs them into the array and then it does the plot separately. So I just did that to isolate them a little bit. It's good organization and there may be other reasons. For example, if you're doing some filtering, you may read a few times and then take an average to remove noise and then do your plot separately. So you're not necessarily doing a single plot I mean, a, a plot for every single read that you do. Another possibility is that you may not be plotting at all, but you still want to do the chain read. 
you know, when you get to the point that you have an actual instrument, that's what you're going to be doing. So those are the, those are the main changes that I really made. Oh yeah. Also, except for the delays. So in the old one, let's see, I just used the delay one function to get a single, um, millisecond. And so to read a whole chain of these things, 64 of them, the milliseconds add up because they're all being muxed, right? That's the idea of the multiplex. So we're trading time for a number of wires. And so we wanted this to go faster. So I changed it to use this delay microseconds function. And I made it a variable. Let's see what the delay time is here. So currently it's at one. So right now everything is at a one microsecond delay. So that means that we can read through the whole thing pretty fast. That's in fact where I've been getting this 100 hertz number. I measured on the scope a little while ago, and um, I, I estimated it was about 140 hertz that it's taking. Of course, you could calculate it by counting the number of digital writes and the number of digital delays if you want to, and that's probably a very good thing, but right now we're just getting tested. Okay, so if anyone has any questions about how the Arduino program works, um, I'll probably get it online sooner or later. Uh, go ahead and ask me in the comments or contact me through my website, etc. Um, I think we're just about at the second half of the video, so I'm going to give you the special treat now. Thanks for sticking with it this long. Okay, so I got the idea for the surprise from one of the comments in my previous video from part two. So if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that one person asked, how's the responsiveness at high speed? Or are you waiting to daisy chain them all up first? Well, I think you could see that we started to look at the responsiveness at high speed with the bar graph and stuff like that. But I wonder if anybody noticed who left this comment, a person named Rob Gwynn. Now, Rob is a very good friend of mine. Thank you for watching the video and commenting, Rob. And Rob also happens to be in a very amazing band called Planet Booty. Planet Booty! Planet Booty! <laughs> okay, yeah, so if you couldn't tell by the wristband on my wrist, I actually got the pleasure of seeing Planet Booty last night. So I thought that I would answer Rob's question, not only technically, but also musically. So, I've got a bunch of Planet Booty samples over in my MPC, and we are actually going to control the effects on the samples using my knob multiplexer board. Yes. So, if you were watching carefully, you probably could tell, I wasn't able to completely hide it, but there are functions in here like send MIDI bytes right and that is what the other serial port for is for this 31,250 baud serial port that's the speed that a MIDI serial port runs at so first I'm gonna do a little demo of it and then we'll take a look at how it works All right, so here we go. I've got my knobs set up with the uh, microcontroller here, and here's the MPC. So I've mapped three different knobs to three different effects. Check it out. There's the flanger. All 
All right, so let's talk just a little bit about how that actually works. So I talked about my bar graph loop where we read all the analog controls and plot the bar graph. And I breezed over it in the beginning, but this is the part that actually does the MIDI sending. Um, there's lots of MIDI information all over the place, but just to recap, most MIDI messages are three bytes. So in this case, we're sending out the hex code B0, then the number one, and then one of my analog values. Now the B0 just means that it's going to be a controller on channel one. And then this one is the controller number. So it's just like if you had any other MIDI controller. And then over here, we saw that the analog values come in as 10-bit values. That is, the maximum value is 1023. Now the way MIDI works is that we actually have to convert that down to a 7-bit system. So in C, we use this little right shift operator by 3 bits. And my comment explains it basically, a 10-bit ADC value to a 7-bit MIDI value. And we'll take a quick look at this actual function called send MIDI bytes. Nothing too special about it. It just takes the three bytes that you hand off to it, and it does a serial write of each one in turn, just byte one, byte two, and byte three. And just one other thing to notice um, with this serial one is in our setup loop is where we actually began it with this serial one begin at 31,250. So that's basically the steps. You start up the serial port, and then anytime you want to send a controller, you call the send MIDI bytes with your values. Just like this. Now let's look at how it's hooked up electrically. Okay, I don't want to uh, delve too deep into the apologies here, but this is basically just a demo video. So it's just going to be a little messy. But basically what I've done is I've got two wires coming off of this uh, microcontroller dev board. One of them is connected to a serial port on pin A4, that's serial 1, and the other is connected to the 3 volt output. MIDI is a little strange in that it's not really about a voltage. So like most signals that are a ground and then some kind of signal pin, MIDI is about a current. So usually what happens is you connect one wire to the, the power source, in this case 3 volts, 3.3 volts, and the other to the signal. And then a diode on the other end detects the current. So you can read more about that elsewhere. Anyway, so I've got these two wires going along here. I'm going to follow them along. Now it turns into alligator clips. And here I've got two resistors. Because MIDI is really uh, concerned about current, you have to have just the right amount of resistance in there. So normally that would be in a circuit board, but I just kind of threw this together uh, after seeing Planet Booty last night. I thought it'd be a really fun way to demo the board. Now here we've got... Um, your DIN 5 socket and I've connected the alligator clips up to pins 4 and pin 5 and now I've just got a good old Radio Shack MIDI cable and that's going up into the MPC. Um, I guess we could talk a little bit about how that was how we set up the uh, the effects so that's over in the MIDI control menu so you go menu to get here and then down here is the option for MIDI control and then you basically use this learn function over here and then oh I don't want to unlearn anything I just did Is that, get out of here oh stop <laughs> okay so the MPC wasn't being very cooperative with me I probably overloaded it with MIDI or something like that to be honest that thing drives me completely crazy anyway but before we go, I want to spend some time showing you what the MIDI signal looks like on an oscilloscope. So what you see here is basically a single three byte MIDI message starting from here and going to there um, as we're continuously sending it. So there's a couple things to see. Um, so you see that we're, because we're in current and not voltage, a one is actually like a low right here. So that's called the start bit and everything has a start bit and um, this part right here, well, okay, so the first byte is going to be that B0, and then this is the number one, and then this is the actual controller number. So I'm going to change the knob, and you see all that activity here? We're sending different values. So right now we're sending a zero, and everything's down low. And then as we send the value one, you see a value goes up to one, 
that's the value 2. It's in binary, by the way. That's 3. Now we'll go to 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on up. So here's the maximum value. So I just thought that would be really interesting. Um, by the way, I, I recompiled the program uh, when I paused the video so that we're only seeing one byte. When I was sending three controllers, you would have seen three bytes. Now let's look at how fast everything's coming out. So I'm going to change the time scale. So now you see three messages coming out one after the other. And we're set for a 2.5 millisecond time scale. So we've got one, two, three windows between there. So that's about 7.5 milliseconds. So if you look at the frequency of 7.5, What's that? Around a hundred, it's, let's see, it's more than a hundred, it's less than 200. So I think that's why I was, I was estimating around 150 hertz. Uh, I think it's actually, what's, what's the reciprocal of seven is like 14. I think that's where I was saying 140 hertz. So that gives us an idea of how long it actually takes to do all of the reading with the delay of microsecond of one and also plotting everything. So if we had to go faster than 140 hertz, and I'm not sure that we'd ever need to, well, that's kind of fun, We, If we had to go faster than 140 hertz, we could take out some delays and also not print the things, or possibly print the things in parallel. And that's how you could still see the values change a little bit. Anyway, okay, that's pretty much the end of this video. In this video, I've demonstrated that the daisy chain is expandable up to 15 knobs. And I've also demonstrated that it's simple with minimal hardware uh, and minimal software to send out to a, um, a sampler and change effects. So what are we going to do in the next video? We are going to put all 64 knobs in one mega daisy chain and finally prove that this thing can work with just three wires on your microcontroller, 64 analog knobs. So bear with me as I'm going to have to order all these circuit boards and order all the parts and solder all the knobs and solder all the chips together. Um, oh yeah, that almost, I, I almost forgot to show you this. On the back, um, these, this is how the board knows which where it is in the daisy chain. I think I alluded to this in the other video, but now you can actually see it. Zoom in for you. See how this jumper is attached to the three on that one? And if we look at this one, the jumper is attached to the two. And the first one I made, it's attached to the one. That's how each board knows which one it is in the chain. There's a little 3-bit uh, signal that goes to the uh, one of eight um, selector, and then that enables the whole entire MUX. So I just wanted to show you that detail before I said goodbye. Make sure that you definitely subscribe, like this video, and share it around to people who want to make instruments with the same quality as, you know, the Behringer Neutron, or maybe even better. If you're going to design or you're going to build any kind of effect processor, it's really good to have a lot of knobs because um, if you undersell the knobs, you find yourself recompiling over and over again, and that just takes a lot of time and you lose a lot of flexibility. So I say go with the most knobs you can. All right, thanks for watching. Bye bye.